Hey, good evening to you. Welcome to Westside. We're glad that you came our way this evening for our devotional time and also for our summer series as well. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit. Uh, we do want to uh, welcome any of our visitors that we may have this evening. Glad that you came our way and we want you to come back at any opportunity you have. We want you to stick around a little bit. Let us get to know you, answer any questions that you may have about Westside. I uh, want to start off with our prayer list this evening, uh, some adjustments to that and some updates. Uh, Angela Richards' father, uh, Ralph Wallace, had a, his procedure went well this week. Uh, he is scheduled to be moved to skilled nursing uh, tomorrow. And so please keep him in your prayers. Uh, he is doing a little bit better, so that is good news. And hopefully skilled nursing will help him to improve even more. Uh, remember also Carolyn Dethridge is in Norman Regional uh, on the Porter location. She's in room 3915 and I know that she would appreciate visitors. So please keep her in your prayers if you would. Also, also uh, Catherine Salyer was taken to the hospital over the weekend. I uh, don't have an update this at this time on her condition, but please remember her in your prayers as well. Uh, remember that our VBS is, will begin on Monday and preparations are underway to begin uh, for that. And that will be at 6 to 8 p.m. starting Monday. And fact is you can register your children online and their friends as well. That would be on the website, the, the Westside website, and you can go through some tabs to do that. So please keep that in mind and plan to do that. That is an easy way to get registered ahead of time. And uh, also, I want to congratulate Riley Frank. She was baptized on Sunday. And so we're very happy for her and her family. So if you have the opportunity, be sure to congratulate her. Uh, we will continue our summer series this evening. Our theme is Reset. Thorne Turner is going to be presenting our lesson on Reset My Prayer Life. Thorne is the youth minister at uh, Southwest in Ada, and he is engaged to be married. And his, his fiance, Carly, is with us tonight. We're very happy to have you as well. Glad that you could be here with us. And they're going to be married in August. So congratulations to you. And we're glad that you are with us tonight. And it's just really great to see some of our own teens uh, stepping up and doing great things in the ministry. So, Thorne, we're very proud of you and what you are doing. Keep up the good work, my friend. And he will be speaking to us at our devotional time here in just a few minutes. And he will also uh, speak at our class time as well. Uh, for our teens, I uh, want to remind you about what is going on with VBS. Uh, the VBS prep for our teens will be Sunday evening following services, and many of our teens aren't here tonight because they're with Garrett, and he is speaking in Edmond, but uh, parents, please keep that in mind as well. And then anyone, actually anyone who would like to help uh, decorate or help set up for VBS, that will be taking place Sunday evening following worship. I think that's all the announcements I have at this time. Uh, leading our songs tonight will be Ryan Dent, and Jeff McGraw will lead our prayer, and then Thorne will bring our devotional thoughts and offer the invitation for us. Let's sing together as Ryan leads us. Good evening. This theme, is it for me? Is it for me, dear Savior, thy glory and thy rest? For me so weak and sinful, oh, shall I be so blessed? Oh, Savior, my Redeemer, what can I but hope for? And magnify and praise thee and love thee evermore. I'll be with thee forever and never grieve thee more. Dear Savior, I must. 
us praise Thee and love Thee evermore. O Savior, my Redeemer, what can I but adore? And magnify and praise Thee and love Thee evermore. We'll now be led in our opening prayer. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all that you do for us. Thank you for watching over us. Thank you for letting us come together tonight uh, to listen to your word and get to spend time with our church family and our congregation. Just help us to uh, open our minds and open our hearts uh, to the word this evening and just help us to carry that through the rest of this week. Dear Lord, um, just watch over everyone um, there's so much going on these days. Um, just help us to remember that to come to you and put those worries and concerns at your feet and just help us to love you first and foremost and love those around us. Please help us when we fall short. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Dear Lord and Father of mankind, forgive our foolish ways. Reclothe us in our rightful mind in pure lives. Thy service find in thee the reverence praise in simple trust like theirs who heard beside the Syrian sea the gracious calling of the Lord let us like them without a word rise up and follow thee. Drop thy still dews of quietness till all our striving cease. Take from our souls the strain and stress and let our ordered lives confess the beauty of thy peace. Good evening. Really excited to be back here at Westside. Uh, Garrett invited me to come speak here. I was really excited. And then Garrett told me that he was going to be in Edmond and take all the teenagers that I like to get to see all summer with him. And then my parents told me that they had already scheduled uh, their vacation this week as well. I'm glad all of you showed up here. It's good to see uh, this part of my family. Um, and all of that aside, I'm really happy to be here and get to speak to you. Uh, tonight. Tonight, my topic will be prayer. Um, but before we get to lofty things such as prayer, uh, I used to play tennis. I used to play tennis a lot. Tennis was my thing in high school. Um, it, it was my favorite place to be, my favorite time of the day. I would sit there all day and I probably spent too much time thinking about tennis all throughout the day. Tennis was my last hour. I was just waiting to get out to the courts to play, to hit to do well, what I love to do. And then I would go to tournaments and I would be really excited. Uh, it, it was the thing that all of that practice and all of that work had been building up to. And uh, as I was going up, I would have all these little like pregame rituals. I don't know if y'all ever had anything like that. The, the things that you have to do that have to be done in the right order every time. Uh, there's, there's the certain there, I had a playlist 
and that playlist had to be listened to all the way through on the bus ride there. And then there was a song that I had to hear right before I went out onto the court. Uh, we always went to the same Chick-fil-A in OKC before the Oklahoma City tennis tournaments and had the same blessing from the same lady who, who was there that worked at that Chick-fil-A, who was our friend. All of these things had to line up in perfect order for me to go out onto the court and feel right, to, to feel like, like all of it was happening. I did all of this in preparation to go and play. Jesus, as he's going throughout his ministry, uh, as he's going to do some of the most important things that, that will happen throughout his time uh, on this earth and working to, to build the kingdom and establish it for us, to, to give us the life and hope that he gives, uh, as he's about to make a lot of the biggest decisions, as he's about to face a lot of his greatest trials, he goes away to be alone. And in those times, he draws closer to God. He gets away from the crowds, from whatever work he was doing, from whatever was going on. Jesus goes away to be by himself before he begins his ministry, before he chooses the 12 apostles, uh, and before he goes to be crucified. Jesus seeks time alone to talk to God. Jesus, uh, when the big serious things were happening, had his pregame ritual, and that was speaking with the Father. And in that uh, final one before he goes to face the cross, uh, in Matthew uh, chapter 26, he takes a few of his uh, apostles with him, but even them he eventually leaves behind as he's going to approach God one last time before his greatest moment. In Matthew 26 starting in verse 36, it says, Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to his disciples, found them sleeping, and he said to Peter, so you could not watch with me one hour. Watch and pray that you do not fall into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then he goes and prays this a second time, and he prays it again and over again, the same prayer that he prays. If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Before Jesus goes to face the cross, before Jesus goes to die bearing the weight of all of our sin, that we might live dying in our place, Jesus prays to God. When everyone else around him is too weak to follow him, who doesn't understand the gravity of all that's about to happen and won't until after he's gone and done it and then come back and explained it to them from the dead. Jesus goes to speak with God, to draw closer to him one last time, to reaffirm uh, one more time that this is the will of God that he's doing, that he's doing it not for himself. But to the very end, he does not serve his flesh, but he lives and dies for you and me. So this example of Jesus that we see, uh, your takeaway for this little Devo tonight. The example that Jesus gives is that when something important is about to happen, he goes and talks to God. That the most significant things in his life are not to be faced without consulting the Father first, without connecting with God before he goes to face him. How often in our lives is that same thing true for us? When I'm about to face 
the most difficult things or even some things that we could consider mundane. How often when I have something to consider, do I consult and connect with the God who loves and cares for me enough to die for me first? How often do I consider connecting with him when I go to face the challenges in my life? Every situation we face could be improved by more than just some silly pregame rituals or the things that, that we do in our life, having the right breakfast and listening to the right songs. More important than any of those things, we as Christians have a Savior, have a God who wants to have a personal connection with us in our lives. Who has given us this avenue of prayer that we might uh, approach him, talk to him about all of our troubles, all of our worries, all of our challenges, before we even go to face them. So tonight, uh, so we're about to stand and sing and go our separate ways to classes and things. If you need to reestablish that connection or begin it tonight with God, if you need to pray, if you've been struggling with that, or if you have any other needs of the church, would you please come forward now as you stand and as we sing? A wonderful song, a wonderful song I now can sing. In my heart, joy bells ring. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and death. Praise his name, he is my king. A wonderful song he is to me. I am redeemed no more to die, never to say goodbye. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. And some of these days in that fair land, sing with the chorus grand. He gave me a song, a wonderful song. He gave me a song to sing about. He lifted me from sin and doubt. Oh, praise his name. He is my king, a wonderful song he is to me. You're now dismissed for your classes.
evening again. So tonight, uh, I'm going to dive deeper into this uh, thought on prayer. Um, we'll begin in uh, James, if you'd like to be turning to James uh, chapter 5 there. Uh, this week, uh, these past couple weeks, as I've been thinking about this lesson, uh, naturally, when you're given the topic of prayer, I feel like you end up praying more often and thinking about more opportunities. To, it's like somebody telling you, don't look down. You just look, you want, all you do is look down. Uh, it's uh, the similar idea that, that this idea of prayer has been more on my mind. And it's been, it's been very good for me lately. I feel like this is one of those areas that I could do really well to improve in. It's one of those things that I feel like I'll never stop uh, growing in or needing to grow in in my prayer life. There's always uh, more that I could be doing to connect with God and to talk to him through the avenue that he's given us that is uh, prayer. Um, prayer seems uh, very often, I think, like like a fairly straightforward thing. The, the, the scripture uh, often that we're given about prayer is fairly straightforward. Uh, I want to give you uh, at least uh, maybe a little bit different uh, of a lesson on prayer tonight, maybe a thought uh, that you hadn't considered, or maybe you have or uh, a story at least that I don't think is often talked about in the context of prayer. Um, we'll begin in James and then move into the Old Testament, into something that James references there at the end of chapter 5, um, and talk about why it is, I think, um, that James takes the time to bring that up. And by the end of all of this, I want us to be thinking uh, about what it means that we are connected to God, what our connection to God really means and should look like, and how that should affect my life and the lives of those around me. Because prayer is one of the most, if not the uh, clearest way we have to be connected to our God. I can speak to him at any moment. We come together to pray. The apostles, when they begin their ministry in Acts, they, they devote themselves to prayer. Uh, it's this thing that is uh, amazing and significant and unique, and it, it draws us together. But I think it, it can be um, so much more than what we often allow it to be. Um, so without any more ado or build up, uh, in James chapter 5, um, I'll be beginning in verse 13 here. It says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. James is a pretty straightforward writer. He's very practical. He speaks in very common sense terms. Uh, when he says things, there's not a whole lot um, of work that we have to do to, to figure out all that he's trying to say. And especially here as he's talking about prayer, ending up this uh, letter that he's written to the churches, to the diaspora. And he begins, is anyone among you suffering? And I feel like in our world, this is uh, possibly the most uh, common thing that people come to God with. Uh, people that aren't Christians or don't claim to have any faith, I, it's at least a very common sitcom and movie uh, trope that the character in movies and things uh, that, that's uh, constantly going on about how they don't believe in things at the end of the movie, they'll be about to die. The boulder's about to fall on their head. The meteors and the sky is falling. And then you see them praying to God, say, please save me. And it's very uh, funny uh, to see all of that. I feel like a lot of times in our world, uh, this is one of the most uh, common things, even Christians 
find themselves maybe praying more, approaching God more when they're suffering. And not necessarily that even that that's a bad thing, that, that we find ourselves approaching God more in that. Because in a lot of ways, that's where we find God, that this is suffering is a way that God uh, seeks to connect with us to, to show uh, his uh, willingness to be more like us, to, to uh, live with us, that God has suffered more than any of us will ever be able to understand, and he did it for our sake. God took on flesh. He lived and died in our place. He took the most gruesome and horrible and disgusting and difficult death possible that we might all live, and he did that on purpose. That God had been suffering over and over and over again from the very beginning as humanity creates the, cha the chasm between uh, God and him for, for so long uh, in the Old Testament until he finally did sentence his Savior. God understands suffering. God is a God who suffers. Um, and so James here, as he begins this talk on prayer, uh, with one of the most common things I think that anybody comes to him with. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. And then he says, if anyone is cheerful, let him sing praise. Uh, singing praise, not necessarily the same thing as prayer, but all of these things about approaching God, um, still calling upon God's name, lifting him up in worship. The other day, uh, Monday, we got to go to the first area wide of the summer, and I love those area wides. I love uh, getting to bring my group of teenagers together uh, to get them to have more connections uh, with other Christians other than just themselves, to get them to see that they are not just the only ones because they feel like that sometimes being an Ada. Um, those are always uh, really fun trips. We get to go have dinner together. We get to have snacks with all the other teenagers. Afterward, uh, we get to worship together. And then on the bus rides home, when everybody's all excited and we're having our sugar rushes uh, from the snacks that we had, um, and one of the kids has the augs cord to the bus, and they've got the music cranked up, and, and we're playing Africa by Toto as loud as possible. Everybody's laughing and screaming along, and none of us can sing that very well. Uh, but it's, it's a really fun and funny time, and as I was thinking uh, about all of these things and being more mindful uh, about all of this, in that moment, I was extremely cheerful and I thought to myself, God has allowed this moment and blessed me with this. I am cheerful now because, God, because of God, that he has brought me together with uh, these kids that I've been blessed to work with, that my joy here exists because, because of God and nothing else. And in that moment, I just said a quick little thank you to God to myself. In that moment, I stopped and thought about this because I was cheerful, and so I praise God for it. The simple things uh, like that throughout our life, um, we can easily, if we take the time, connect to God and thank him for all the blessings in our life, um, as well as uh, thanking him for being the one who suffers alongside of us. Um, then is anyone among you sick? Um, let him call among the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Um, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. I um, don't think that James is necessarily talking about physical sickness here um, or that we as Christians now in today's day and age still have the miraculous power of healing. Uh, don't buy any napkins off of any uh, TV preachers that you see uh, for healing purposes. Uh, I think what James is talking about is spiritual sickness. As he goes on uh, to talk about uh, confessing sins and praying for one another for that kind, for spiritual healing, for, for healing in faith, for having a sickness of faith, for the prayers of faith that will save that sick one. James is saying in this final uh, point that he builds up before uh, we move on to the, the next bit here. 
that in everything, in our suffering, in our good times, when we're feeling close to God and full of faith, or when we're feeling as though our faith is weak, we approach God, and more than that, we come together with one another, approaching God for one another, that, that we all might find salvation in that way. That through our approaching God, we are interconnected in every part of our lives. Whether we're suffering or we're cheerful, whether my faith is great or whether I'm struggling with it, that James calls the church uh, to come together. If your faith needs help, go to the elders, those who have been appointed uh, above others, that they may help you with that, that that sickness might be overcome, that they may strengthen your faith. Or if you are physically suffering, or if you're cheerful, and all of these things, pray for one another. Because the prayer of a righteous person has great uh, power as it is working. And then he gets uh, to this next point. This screen is super handy. I need to take this back to Ada. Um, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. And this seems a little bit like a, a random sort of interjection by James here. And I struggled a little bit as I was studying this to sort of understand why all of a sudden he chooses Elijah as an example. This is James, the brother of Jesus. James, the, the Christian leader that, that we believe to be the, the leader of the church in Jerusalem uh, during his time. We talked about earlier in that little uh, Devo bit about one of the more significant prayers that Jesus gives throughout his ministry, if not the most significant one. So many examples he could have pulled from and here, as he's talking about all of these things, he chooses Elijah of all people. And Elijah was a great prophet, a great leader, one that's referenced. People thought Jesus might be Elijah coming again. Uh, he's a significant uh, character. He means something great. But Elijah, and especially this example, seems maybe just a little bit uh, random or, or out of place or a bit of a stretch uh, for James to be referencing here. But Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, he performs this miraculous thing through prayer. We'll look at that in a second and spend a lot of our night talking about why James chose to bring this up. Um, why Elijah's prayer is so significant and what it has to do uh, with all these thoughts that, that he begins with here at the first bit of this passage. Um, and although it seems uh, a little strange before we get into it, uh, I want to tell you that I think that this is showing uh, the heart in this story of what God wants from us through prayer, or why he has given us this avenue to talk to him, what it means that, that we are connected uh, to God is shown completely in this story uh, that James references here. So if you want to turn with me uh, now to uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, we'll begin at the very last uh, bit of this story here. First Kings chapter 16, um, I'll begin in verse 30. It says, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord, more than all who were before him, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He took for his wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria, 
and Ahab made an Asherah, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Before Elijah is going to come and do these things, uh, we see this King Ahab and his wife as well um, following sort of the pattern that kings builds up to this point. I remember my senior year of high school when I was in the youth group here, the, the Kings and the Chronicles were what Brett was going over in our Sunday morning classes for a long time there. Um, and over and over and over again, you see this pattern of either the king did evil in the sight of the Lord, uh, according to the way of uh, either Jeroboam or any of the ones who came before him. But this Ahab guy is the worst. He is the, the bottom of the barrel, the worst of the worst, doing more evil, more to provoke God to anger than any of the ones before him. He erects altars uh, to Baal. He tears down the things of the Lord. He, he and his wife Jezebel, whom he marries for political reasons, uh, the, the princess of the enemy, the Sidonians, who are the people who are pressing in on the nation at the time, on the people of God who are oppressing them or in the process of it. Um, he does all of these things to appease her. He erects these altars and the, the Asherahs, which are these giant, the, my kids call them the Twizzler poles, the big twisty things um, uh, that you worship all of these false gods at. Uh, Ahab does all of this and more disregarding the Lord entirely. And God will not stand for it. God sees his people suffering, hears them rejecting him, being led astray, sees his prophet uh, Elijah struggling alone, being outcast by all of these things. And so he decides to do something about it. In chapter 17, verse 1, Elijah the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. And that's it. This is the, the prayer that James is referencing there in James chapter 5. Not much of a prayer for what we have recorded, more of a, a statement that he comes to the king with, but this is what it is. The Lord has said that it will be, and so it is. There's not going to be rain except by my word for these several years here. And then God sends him away to depart. And for a little while, he's by uh, this brook and he's being provided food by a raven, which sounds pretty cool. Um, before there were drones, there were ravens to bring us things. Um, and he's getting water by this brook until it is dried up. And then God sends Elijah to Zarephath, which is up to the land of the enemy. Instead of being in the land of his people, instead of being able to stay in Israel and help out the people that, that he, he's known all of his life, his family, his kin, God sends him away to the land of the enemy. The land of the people who are oppressing him, who brought this Jezebel, who led Ahab to doing all of this evil and causing this drought to come. That is where God sends Elijah. But Elijah doesn't uh, argue or have any uh, thing to say back to God. In verse 10 of chapter 17, it says, So he rose and went to Zarephath. And he came to the gate of the city, and behold, a widow was there gathering six. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water and a vessel that I might drink. As she was going to bring it, he called to her, said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in, and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear, 
go and do as you have said, but first make me a little cake and bring it to me, and afterward make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, the jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain upon the earth. And so she goes and does, and once again, Elijah speaks the word of God, and it is so. Miraculously, these things uh, do not run out, and Elijah stays with them for a while. And then uh, quickly in the next episode, the next thing that we see, um, the son of the woman um, becomes ill, and the illness is severe such that there's no breath left in him. The son dies. After Elijah comes and provides this miracle, life and hope are provided for these people who had given up on it. And then in the very next scene, however much time has passed, the son is dead. All of that ripped away as though for nothing. And then we see once again, in verse 19, Elijah says, uh, he says to her, give me your son, And he took him from her arms and carried him up to the upper chamber where he lodged, laid him on his own bed, and he cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord my God, let this child's life come to him again. The Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. Elijah took the child, brought him down from the upper chamber in the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. The woman said to Elijah, now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is true. Your Elijah prays to God. Over and over and over again, he speaks to God that the son might live. God hears him and answers, and God is working. And here we see hinted at uh, what all of this uh, story in these few chapters is sort of building to, and this little aside in Zarephath as it ends before Elijah goes to face Ahab again and bring the rain back um, and reestablish God and his kingdom and to his people before any of that really gets underway. The woman says, now I know that you are a man of God, that the word of the Lord is true. This is the idea that James is trying to get at, that this story will continue to build on here in a second. Elijah prays, Elijah speaks the word of God. Elijah shows that he is connected to the one who truly has power over life and death and all of the physical things. And it affects those around him. It provides life and hope where there was none. Uh, Continuing on, uh, Elijah goes in chapter 18, Uh, To confront Ahab, he calls uh, one of Ahab's servants, Obadiah, uh, to bring Ahab to him that they might meet uh, and finally have this really cool showdown on top of the mountain. Um, In verse 17 of chapter 18, it says, when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have in your father's house because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. And now therefore send and gather all of Israel to me at Mount Carmel and the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even only I, am left a prophet of the Lord. The Baal's prophets are 450 men. So they're gathered up on Mount Carmel. 
And I forgot to put the picture in the slides, but imagine with me uh, a mountain kind of like this little range here. They're not super tall Mount Everest mountains that are happening in Israel in that area. They're kind of like the, the mountains we have over in Lawton. Um, they're, they're sort of really tall, rocky hills that, that flatten out. And Mount Carmel is sort of a per perfect situation for this, uh, that thousands of people can gather up on this plateau, and then there's one higher place up above all of this the, that you could look up on all that was about to happen where these altars are going to be built, and all of this uh, challenge is going to come and take place. Um, so Elijah, with all of the prophets of Baal and Asherah, all of uh, the people who worship uh, these other gods who have been leading the people uh, of Israel into the sin with them. Um, he sets forth this challenge. He says, you build an altar over here. I'll build an altar over here. You call out to your gods and I'll call out to mine. And then we will see who is God. The one who answers by fire, he is God, is what the text says. And they say, that is well spoken. That sounds good. Sounds great, Elijah. Let's do it. It's fair enough. We'll play by your rules. In verse 26, they took the bull that was given to them. They prepared it, called upon the name of Baal from morning till noon, saying, Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. They limped around the altar that they had made, and at noon Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing or he's relieving himself or he is on a journey, or perhaps he's asleep and must be awakened. They cried aloud and cut themselves after the custom with their swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. As midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of oblation, but there was no voice, and no one answered, and no one paid attention. I have to imagine this must have been at least a little bit entertaining uh, for Elijah. He, clearly it was as he's sitting there mocking them, uh, making jokes and having fun with the situation. Maybe he's just in the bathroom is essentially what he says to the prophets of Baal. And this has to be a tense situation. The prophets of Baal, hundreds of them are gathered on the other mountain. They've all got weapons in their hands. Uh, luckily, they're using them to cut themselves and not uh, attacking Elijah with them, at least at the moment. The prophets of Asherah are spread out among the people, probably whispering to everybody, starting all sorts of things, saying, this Elijah guy is ridiculous. How could this happen? He, well, if we can't get, surely he's not going to be able to do anything more than we're able to do. There's only Elijah. Despite all of that, Elijah stands and laughs. Then he gathers the people together. He builds his altar with 12 stones to signify uh, the 12 tribes. He calls upon the people to pour water on it three times so that there could be no doubt that God is going to be the one who is working here. In verse 36, at the time of the offering of oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. And then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering the wood and the stones and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. At the end of it all, the people turn back to the one who truly is God. There's no more question Elijah's name, meaning Yahweh is God, is shown and fulfilled in fullness here. And one of the last uh, great things that he'll do before he's done on this earth and he'll ascend in the chariot of fire. 
Here, one last time, Elijah prays to God. And we see the point of all of it in the people and how they react to all of this. The, the reason why James brings up Elijah in the first place all the way back in James chapter 5, where we started. James and Elijah, God, they want us to see that prayer is not simply for us to remember that our God wants to speak to us, to, to simply be a way for us to talk to God. Prayer allows, allows us and those around us to be connected to him, to see that he is living and working and moving. In all of these situations that, that Elijah finds himself in, in all of these scenarios, uh, it's not that something happens and then Elijah prays about it or simply that, that Elijah uh, wants something to happen and then he prays and God fulfills that prayer, but that God has decided to work and to show that he is life and hope, that he is the true and living God. And Elijah prays, and that is shown and clear and present to all of those who are around him. God could have saved the widow's son, but, but if it were not for Elijah there praying to God, she would not have known that it was the Lord who had, who had done it that provided that life and hope, that connection would not have been made there to the one who was not an Israelite, not part of that nation, that connection to a whole other group of people could not have been made if it weren't for Elijah's fervent prayer there. The people of Israel, without uh, Elijah being the, the one he's saying, I, if only I am contending for God, the, the last prophet standing, if he is not there uh, praying for God, God could cause the drought to come, could, could cause the fire to rain down, could do all of these things. But there is Elijah praying to God, calling out to him, speaking his words so that everyone can see that that connection is there. Does that make sense? Through prayer, we are connected to God, uh, but more than that, that connection can be seen and can influence the world around us as well. That's uh, the point, the idea, the thing that, that James is building to back there in James chapter 5. That when we are suffering, when we are cheerful, when our faith or the faith of those around us needs to be built up, needs to be strengthened, when we have something that we're struggling with, when we know someone who is struggling with something, we pray and we, we show that we are connected to God so that others might be influenced by that connection that we have to God as well. As we bring all of these things uh, to a close here, I'm about out of time. Here's your, your, your takeaway, your application. Pray uh, not so as to try to maybe influence uh, God to work or to hope that he might be working in my life, but because we know that he is always working. And I recognize that, and I want to see that more. I want that to be shown more in my life and through my life. Pray not only so that you will have more of a connection to God, but, but so that your connection to God can be shown and to cause more to have that same connection with the one who loves and lives, who gives hope, who wants all of us to live with him in eternity. Pray to connect with God. Pray that God might have more connection in the world around you.
that's all I've got for you uh, this evening. I guess I'll close with the prayer, putting a lot of pressure on myself, having just given the sermon on prayer. Uh, but thank you all for uh, inviting me and uh, for giving me your time tonight. Uh, let's go to God. God, we, we come to you uh, thankful for all that you've done, for all that you've blessed us with, for the love and the life, the mercy and the grace that you've given us that we don't deserve, that you continue to give, that allows us to be connected to you even though we don't truly deserve you or all that you've given us. God, help us as we go to recognize you to see you moving and working in our lives, to continue to further your kingdom, to build you up, to be more and more like you every day, and to help others to do the same. Be with all of us as we go from here. We thank you for your son once again, for his sacrifice. And it's in his name that we pray, amen.